so we are wrapping up our third unit in this class, social and political theory, by looking at a thinker who I think has some important things to say about what our contemporary age is like, what contemporary society in the West is like, how it influences us, and maybe a good explanation of how a lot of us are feeling and perhaps where we are headed. We're looking today at Eric Fromm. And to understand what Eric Fromm was trying to get at, and what he's trying to say in this piece, The Present Human Condition, I need to summarize for you again some of Marx's philosophy and then the critical theorists who came after him. So Marx, whom I'm sure you have heard of, is, was a really influential philosopher. Somebody who produced in his writings a lot of scathing critiques of capitalism and the capitalist society. Now Marx's philosophy, at least in Das Kapital and in some of his other works, centered a lot around economic analysis of capitalism. And what Marx argued is that this capitalism thing ain't good for us. He thought that capitalism devalued workers, that it oppressed people, that it alienated the working class and others, not only from the labor process, but also the products of their own labor, and from themselves and other people, turning them essentially into commodities, making them poorer in every sense of the word, both economically, but also perhaps spiritually, psychologically, with regards to their character as well. And the capitalist system forces people to contribute to the construction of a society that is going to further oppress them and push them down even more. Now a lot of people didn't agree with Marx's historical and economic analyses, but there was a really influential school and movement that emerged in uh, Germany, the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, who really took to heart a lot of what Marx had to say. But they noticed something very strange. In his historical materialist view of history, what Marx did is he separated the different stages of human, social, and economic development into these phases. And we've gone through them before, but one of the claims that he made was that eventually these capitalist systems are going to kind of implode due to the tensions and oppressions and contradictions within them and what they produce in society. And Marx hypothesized that what we should see is all of these revolutions around the world where capitalist systems are entrenched because the workers would rise up the proletariat would rise up the working class and overthrow the bourgeoisie, their oppressors. The problem was, according to the critical theorists, they weren't seeing these revolutions around the world. Sure, there were some revolutions, but it wasn't happening as quickly or as intensely as Marx predicted. And so they were left with the question, why aren't the working class people overthrowing their oppressors? What is going on? Why, in the West, for example, is capitalism just becoming more and more entrenched in a part of people's lives, growing and becoming stronger? And through their thought and reflection, they realize something. That while Marx may have been correct on his economic analysis, he didn't go far enough in his exploration of capitalism and how it reproduces itself. The critical theorists discovered and then philosophized about this idea that capitalism is recreated and supported and maintained in these places because of their cultures. 
because of the norms, the values, the terms, the categories, everything that has to do with culture was influencing these people to accept capitalism and then reproduce it through their actions. And so what the critical theorists end up doing, those first generation ones in the 1920s, like Fromm, for example, and then the later critical theorists, took Marx's economic analysis and decided to apply it to the cultural sphere. They did this because they thought by undermining the culture of these places or getting people to look at it differently, getting people to change the culture, might lead to these revolutions. And it might wake people up so that they could see how messed up their societies were and change things for the better. Fromm is a critical theorist as well. And so what he's going to be doing in this piece today is he's going to try to describe for us what contemporary Western society looks like, at least, at least from the point of view of the 1950s. And he's going to rely heavily on some Marxist ideas and Marxist analysis to make these claims. Inspired by psychoanalysis, by figures like Freud and Jung as well, he's going to apply Marx's critique of economics to more spheres of human life. And generally, what we see in Marx's philosophy and in the philosophies of the critical theorists after him are two main ideas. One, people in capitalist systems have what is called a false consciousness, and they are not living out their species being. The first term is pretty self-explanatory. What does it mean to have a false consciousness? Well, it means to misunderstand your condition, to misunderstand your society, to not have a holistic grasp or understanding of how this works, how it affects you, the role you play in it, etc. But in addition to this, Fromm and the other critical theorists, along with Marx, thought that one of the reasons the capitalist system is so bad is because it prevents us from creating things freely and seeing ourselves reflected in our own works. Instead, what we see within capitalist systems is we're forced to work for other people, produce what they want. We don't get to keep the products of our labor, like houses, right? or whatever it is that you build in the factory, and you have to sell your labor or your labor power in order to make ends meet, which results in the deterioration of the human being. Alienation, perhaps a nihilistic, empty outlook on life. And so that's basically what Fromm is going to be saying today. Although a big part of his analysis of Western society, as we'll see, is how entrenched consumerism has become and how this is really contributing in some sense towards our unhappiness and the degradation of the moral human being. So hopefully that's a little good overview for you of what Fromm has, what's, go what's going on in this piece. I'm going to be reading a few pages from his book, Escape from Freedom, today, as well as an excerpt from the essay I asked you all to read. And that should give you kind of a big picture view of some of Fromm's main ideas that he was wrestling with during his time. One of the main ideas that he's wrestling with in this book is the failure of the Enlightenment to live up to its promises, in some sense. Recall the Enlightenment, which we discussed in the first unit. The Enlightenment was all about applying reason and the scientific method to the world in order to understand it better, to make progress, to build things. And a lot of Enlightenment thinkers thought that if we just do this reason thing correctly, if we apply the scientific method appropriately, we'll be able to usher in something like a golden age for humanity. We'll be able to increase wealth, standards of living, make all this cool stuff, and make people happier. 
Now, in some sense that happened, right? The West today, for example, is richer than it has ever been. Our standard of living in human history is better than it has ever been. But there are obviously problems, right? Yes, we've invented a whole bunch of new things that have made our lives easier, as we saw in the philosophy of Hannah Arendt. Computers and tables and tools and all these different things. Awesome advances in medical technology, which saves human life. Growing literacy rates. But there's still poverty, right? And inequality. You might even say discrimination and oppression, depending on what social group you are a part of. And so we don't live in a golden age, right? Things are not perfect. And if you dig a little bit deeper, you might start thinking also that the human being is more bankrupt now than they have ever been, morally, existentially. There is this general feeling in our society today, it, Fromm thinks he noticed it in the 1900s, that people are losing the meaning and purpose of life. Nihilism is growing. We feel lost and confused, aimless, adrift in the sea of consumerist products, of these artificial needs and desires for things that don't really help us. What seems to characterize your generation is a lot of cynicism and lack of hope about your own future. And this isn't, you know, new, but I think it is a testament to the kinds of general feelings and ideas that people are having nowadays. Not only about whether or not they're going to be able to succeed, but about whether they feel their life is actually fulfilling, and whether or not they're happy. And there are a bunch of different reasons for why there is this growing nihilism, malaise, unhappiness, addiction, etc. But one of the things that Fromm hones in on in this book is liberation that we've experienced from some of those bonds and meta narratives that in the past grounded human life. While in Western society we have seen growing political freedom, right? We can basically live our lives the way that we want. We have free speech freedom of religion, we're not forced to do many things. While there has been growing freedom in this domain, Fromm also argues that there has been, that has gone along with a certain kind of alienation and purposelessness. This is something that we've also experienced. And so what he discusses in this book is in Western society, as freedom to do things has grown, freedom from the bonds that used to provide us purpose and security, and those mythologies and stories that provided meaning in human life has also grown. And he discusses this on pages 50 to 53 here. He says, freedom from is not identical with positive freedom, freedom to. The emergence of man from nature is a long drawn out process. To a large extent, he remains tied to the world from which he emerged. He remains part of nature. The soil he lives on, the sun and moon and stars, the trees and flowers, the animals and the group of people with whom he is connected by the ties of blood. Their family, right? Primitive religions bear testimony to man's feeling of oneness with nature. Animate and inanimate nature are part of his human world. Or, as one may also put it, he is still part of the natural world. These primary ties block his full human development. They stand in the way of the development of his reason and his critical capacities. They let him recognize himself and others only through the medium of his, or their, participation in a clan, a social or religious community and not as human beings. In other words, 
they block his development as a free, self-determining, productive individual. But although this is one aspect, this is not the only one. The, this identity with nature, clan, religion, gives the individual security. He belongs to, he is rooted in, a structuralized whole in which he has an unquestionable place. He may suffer from hunger or suppression, but he does not suffer from the worst of all pains, complete aloneness and doubt. We see that the process of growing human freedom has the same dialectic character that we have noticed in the process of individual growth. On the one hand, it is a process of growing strength and integration, mastery of nature, growing power of human reason, and growing solidarity with other human beings. But on the other hand, this growing individuation means growing isolation, insecurity, and thereby growing doubt concerning one's own role in the universe, the meaning of one's life, and with all that, a growing feeling of one's own powerlessness and insignificance as an individual. If the process of the development of mankind had been harmonious, if it had followed a certain plan, then both sides of this development, the growing strength and the growing individuation of the single person, would have been exactly balanced. As it is, the history of mankind is one of conflict and strife. Each step in the direction of growing individuation threatened people with new insecurities. Primary bonds once severed cannot be mended. Once paradise is lost, man cannot return to it. There is only one possible productive solution for the relationship of individualized man with the world. His active solidarity with all men and his spontaneous activity, love, and work which unite him again with the world, not by primary ties, but as a free and independent individual. However, if the economic, social, and political conditions on which the whole process of human individuation depends do not offer a basis for the realization in this sense, while at the same time people have lost those ties which gave them security, this leg makes freedom an unbearable burden. It then becomes identical with doubt, with a kind of life which lacks meaning and direction. Powerful tendencies arise to escape from this kind of freedom into submission, or some kind of relationship to man and the world which promises relief from uncertainty, even if it deprives the individual of his freedom. European and American history since the end of the Middle Ages is the history of the full emergence of the individual. It is the process which started in Italy, in the Renaissance, and which only now seems to have come to a climax. It took over 400 years to break down the medieval world and to free people from the most apparent restraints, such as what religion, tradition once placed on us. But while in many respects the individual has grown, has developed mentally and emotionally, and participates in cultural achievements in a degree unheard of before, the lag between freedom from and freedom to has grown as well. The result of this disproportion between freedom from any tie and the lack of possibilities for the positive realization of freedom excuse me, and individuality has led in Europe to a panicky flight from freedom into new ties, or at least into complete indifference. And so what Fromm is trying to get us to see is over the last few centuries, what we have experienced in the West is growing political freedom, freedom over our own lives and thoughts, but also at the same time growing insecurity, growing isolation, growing purposelessness. How many of you now have 
Strong relationships with your neighbors. Do you even know them? It used to be that we all lived with our families in close-knit communities. Not anymore. Some of you are going to college in a state different from your parents. You are leaving them behind. You've left your high school friends behind. Maybe you haven't formed deep relationships with other college students. And how have we constructed life? We live in our individual concrete boxes. We drive in our metal boxes to work and school alone. We watch our TV shows alone. We don't want to interact with people out there. And there is growing cynicism, growing sarcasm, a fear to actually be vulnerable and feel things, which we mask with what? Drugs, alcohol. So while we have grown in our ability to live our lives how we want, we have become separated from those things that used to provide meaning and purpose to human life, such as religion, tradition, family, and community. In the past, that was the stuff that bound us together. The clan that we were a part of, or the religion that we all worshipped, the God that we worshipped, or our tradition, or our ethnicity, those kinds of things. But not anymore. Now, Fromm argues, it is the market that unites us. The market unites human beings in the West. And ultimately, this is not a good thing. The market is not fit, he thinks, to provide us with the meaning and purpose that we, as human beings, once had. Instead, what it has done is, as we'll see, it has compelled us to conform to certain standards and ideas that are not our own, preventing us from really understanding who we are and living freely, personally chosen, authentic, and fulfilled lives. We no longer are bound together so strongly by a certain tradition, religion, family, or the state. <coughs> you probably do not feel much allegiance or meaning from your identity as an American, right? Do you feel much allegiance or identity in your family name? Or your family's ancestry? Do you know where your family came from? When they emigrated? Who they were? What they believed? Did you even know them at all? Throughout the centuries, thus, Fromm is going to say, we have lost touch with these things. We don't understand our past. We aren't bound to one another deeply and meaningfully like we used to be. Instead, now, human society, instead of being based around one of these, a certain tradition or history, family, religion, or nation, Human society is based around production and consumption. Isn't this what defines our lives now? We mark ourselves off from others by the things that we consume. Oh, you're a Star Wars fan? I was a Degrassi fan. Oh, you're an Avengers fan? I like metal music. 
Oh, you like Taylor's version? No, I prefer Lil Nas X. Right? Now, the way that we understand ourselves and others, and the way that we individuate ourselves, is through consumption of things. Whether that is food, drink, digital media, music, movies, TV shows, whatever. These things are what our, our identities are rooted in. And that is not good. This is not a good way to live, Fromm thinks. Now, he thinks materialism governs our lives. And in some sense, our desires, our beliefs, our very wills are oriented towards things that we did not personally choose and which we probably don't personally really want if we took the time to actually reflect on it. We judge our own worth instrumentally by how productive we are by how much money we make, by how well we are seen by others. Do any of you feel upset with yourselves because you're not as productive with homework as you should be a certain night? Because you don't make as much money as your friend? Because you're not pumping out kids like some of your high school friends? Maybe this is a millennial thing. <laughs> In any case, what Fromm is trying to get us to see is that what our identities are rooted in are not the things of our ancestors, but in the material stuff of our day. And ultimately, this is leading us to unhappiness and unfulfillment. <coughs> this wouldn't be so bad, perhaps, if we fully understood our situation if we had the capacities and the time and the energy to reflect and fix things, if we had the means to do so. But how many of you have the means to actually radically alter your life? Have you reflected deeply on what it is that you actually want? Are you living according to your own desires? or your parents' expectations? Are you building the kind of life you want to live or what society has taught you you should want? These are questions that Fromm thinks we need to ask ourselves if we are going to escape from this terrible situation. The capitalist system that we are living within and contributing to, further strengthening, is designed to produce a certain kind of person. And so too are our large mass scale processes of production and consumption. You've probably heard this before, but it's worth repeating because it's one of Fromm's main points here. Does the society we live in produce people who are free thinkers, people who are independent from others, people who have original thoughts and feelings? that are following their own life paths? Fromm is going to say no. Our system is ultimately designed to produce good workers who are going to obey and follow the rules. 
and conform to the standards of our society. Our system cannot function without the production of such people. And so he says on page 276 in Escape from Freedom, what has been said about the lack of originality in feeling and thinking holds true also of the act of willing in our society. To recognize this is particularly difficult. Modern man seems, if anything, to have too many wishes and his only problem seems to be that, although he knows what he wants, he cannot have it. All our energy is spent for the purpose of getting what we want. And most people never question the premise of that activity. That they know their true wants. They do not stop to think whether the aims they are pursuing are something they themselves want. In school, they want to have good marks. As adults, they want to be more and more successful, to make more money, to have more prestige, to buy a better car, to go places, and so on. Yet when they do stop to think in the midst of all this frantic activity, this question may come to their minds. If I do get this new job, if I get this better car, if I can take this trip, what then? What is the use of it all? Is it really I who wants all of this? Am I not running after some goal which is supposed to make me happy and which eludes me as soon as I have reached it? These questions, when they arise, are frightening. For they question the very basis on which man's whole activity is built, his knowledge of what he wants. People tend, therefore, to get rid of them as soon as possible of these disturbing thoughts. They feel that they have been bothered by these questions because they were tired or depressed, and they go on in the pursuit of the aims which they believe are their own. Yet all this bespeaks a dim realization of the truth, the truth that modern man lives under the illusion that he knows what he wants while he actually wants what he is supposed to want. In order to accept this, it is necessary to realize that to know what one really wants is not comparatively easy, as most people think, but one of the most difficult problems any human being has to solve. It is a task we frantically try to avoid by accepting ready-made goals as though they were our own. Modern man is ready to take great risks when he tries to achieve his aims, which are supposed to be his, but he is deeply afraid of taking the risk and the responsibility of giving himself his own aims. Intense activity is often mistaken for evidence of self-determined action. Although we know that it may well be no more spontaneous than the behavior of an actor, or a person hypnotized. When the general plot of the play is handed out, each actor can act vigorously the role he is assigned and even make up his lines and certain details of the action by himself. Yet he is only playing a role that has been handed over to him. The particular difficulty in recognizing to what extent our wishes and our own thoughts and feelings as well are not really our own but put into us from the outside is closely linked up with the problem of authority and freedom. In the course of modern history, the authority of the church has been replaced by that of the state, that of the state by that of conscience. And in our era, conscience has been replaced by the anonymous authority of common sense and public opinion as instruments of conformity. Because we have freed ourselves of the older, overt forms of authority, we do not see that we have become the prey of a new kind of authority. We have become automatons who live under the illusion 
of being self-willing individuals. This illusion helps the individual to remain unaware of his insecurity. But this is all the help such an illusion can give. Basically, the self of the individual is weakened, such that he feels powerless and extremely insecure. He lives in a world to which he has lost genuine relatedness, and in which everybody and everything has become instrumentalized, where he has become a part of the machine that his hands have built. He thinks, feels, wills what he believes he is supposed to think, feel, and will. In this very process, he loses his self upon which all genuine security of a free individual must be built. The loss of the self has increased the necessity to conform, for it results in a profound doubt of one's own identity. If I am nothing but what I believe I'm supposed to be, who am I? We have seen how the doubt about one's own self started with the breakdown of the medieval order, in which the individual had had an unquestionable place in a fixed order. The identity of the individual has been a major problem of modern philosophy since Descartes. Today we take for granted that we are we. Yet the doubt about ourselves still exists, or has even grown. In his plays, Pirandello has given expression to this feeling of modern man. He starts with the question, who am I? What proof have I for my own identity other than the continuation of my physical self? His answer is not like Descartes, the affirmation of the individual self, but it's denial. I have no identity. There is no self except the one which is the reflex of what others expect me to be. I am as you desire me. This loss of identity then makes it still more imperative to conform. It means that one can be sure of oneself only if one lives up to the expectations of others. If we do not live up to this picture, we not only risk disapproval and increased isolation, but we risk losing the identity of our personality, which means jeopardizing our sanity. By conforming to the expectations of others, by not being different, these doubts about one's own identity are silenced, and a certain security is gained. However, the price paid is high. Giving up spontaneity and individuality results in a thwarting of life. Psychologically, the automaton, while being alive biologically, is dead emotionally and mentally. While he goes through the motions of living, his life runs through his hands like sand. Behind a front of satisfaction and optimism, modern man is deeply unhappy. As a matter of fact, he is on the verge of desperation. He desperately clings to the notion of individuality. He wants to be different. And he has no greater recommendation of anything than that it is different. We are informed of the individual name of the railroad clerk we buy our tickets from. Handbags, playing cards, and portable radios are personalized by having the initials of the owner put on them. All this indicates the hunger for difference, and yet these are almost the last vestiges of individuality left. Modern man is starved for life. But since being an automaton, he cannot experience life in the sense of spontaneous activity, he takes as surrogate any kind of excitement and thrill, the thrill of drinking, of sports, of vicariously living the excitements of fictitious persons on the screen, like Kim Kardashian, or the Real Housewives of New York. What then is the meaning of freedom for modern man? He has become free from the external bonds that would prevent him from doing and thinking as he sees fit. He would be free to act according to his own will. If he only knew what he wanted, thought, and felt. But he does not know. He conforms to anonymous authorities and adopts a self which is not his. The more he does this, the more powerless he feels. The more he is forced to conform. In spite of a veneer of optimism, 
and initiative, modern man is overcome by a profound feeling of powerlessness, which makes him gaze toward approaching catastrophes as though he were paralyzed. Looked at superficially, people appear to function well enough in economic and social life, yet it would be dangerous to overlook the deep-seated unhappiness behind that comforting veneer. If life loses its meaning because it is not lived, man becomes desperate. People do not die quietly from physical starvation. They do not die quietly from psychic starvation either. If we look only at the economic needs as far as the normal person is concerned, if we do not see the unconscious suffering of the average automatized person, then we fail to see the danger that threatens our culture from its human basis. The readiness to accept any ideology or leader. If only he promises excitement and offers a political structure and symbols which allegedly give meaning and order to an individual's life. The despair of the human automaton is fertile soil for the political purposes of fascism. And thus we live in an order, Fromm thinks, that produces conformity. An order that is designed to produce good workers that obey and listen and conform and do what they're told. Without such people, our system cannot survive. We need people to obey and conform and consume. And this is what we do, isn't it? What Fromm is trying to get at here is not only is our society built to produce this kind of person, but these are the kinds of people we are. How often do you reflect on what you are told to hearken back to Plato? Have you really reflected on whether or not you actually want to be here at Point Park? Is this really what you want? Do you want to work a 9 to 5 job in an office the rest of your life and retire at 67? Or do you want to live a different life? Do you actually want to look at your iPhone for three hours a day? Have you thought about that? So not only do we live in a society that is designed to produce automatons, he says, people who obey, who don't think for themselves and reflect, who just consume, but also we don't know who we are because we haven't thought about it. We've just accepted what our parents have told us, what the experts tell us what the government says we're supposed to do, what society says, how we are supposed to live. We've just accepted that and we're doing it and we're going through the motions. We don't really know ourselves. We don't really have many original thoughts and feelings. To hearken back to Rousseau, we have been filled up with all these artificial needs and desires for things that we don't really need, things that we don't really desire. In some sense, what Marx and Fromm are trying to get at is we have been reduced to cogs in the machine. And what's dangerous about this situation is not just that we are unhappy and unfulfilled because of this stuff, but because we do feel insecure and lost. We don't feel like our lives have as much purpose or meaning as they should. He thinks we will gravitate towards any kind of order 
or ideology, even a fascistic one, if it can provide us with some sense of community and security, some kind of order among the chaos that is our lives. Consequently, you might say, modern man is broken. We are alienated, we are unhappy, and we are unwell. We are estranged from others and ourselves. We have lost touch with nature, with spirituality, a lot of us. We are being conditioned to accept and live lives that are not good for us and that don't really bring us happiness and fulfillment. And so to quote the essay I asked you to read for today, Fromm says on page 84, man's character has been molded by the demands of the world he has built with his own hands. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the social character of the middle class showed strong exploitative and hoarding traits. This character was determined by the desire to exploit others and to save one's own earnings to make further profit from them. In the 20th century, man's character orientation shows considerable passivity and an identification with the values of the market. Contemporary man is certainly passive in most of his leisure time. He is the eternal consumer. He takes in drink, food, weed, cigarettes, TV shows, lectures, books, movies. All are consumed, swallowed. The world is one great object for his appetite. A big bottle, a big apple, a big breast. Man has become the suckler, the eternally expectant, and the eternally disappointed. Insofar as modern man is not the consumer, he is the trader. Our economic system is centered in the function of the market as determining the value of all commodities and as the regulator of one's share in the social product. Neither force nor tradition, as in previous periods of history, nor fraud nor trickery govern man's activities. He is free to produce and sell. Market day is the judgment for the success of his efforts. Not only commodities are offered and sold on the market, labor has also become a commodity, sold on the labor market, under the same conditions of fair competition. But the market system has reached out further than the economic sphere. Man has transformed himself into a commodity and experiences his life as capital to be invested profitably. If he, if he succeeds in this, he is successful and his life has meaning. If not, he is a failure. His value lies in his saleability, not in his human qualities of love and reason, nor in his artistic capacities. Hence, his sense of his own value depends on extraneous factors, his success, the judgment of others, the standards of society. Hence, he is dependent on these others, and his security lies in conformity, in never being more than two feet away from the herd. However, it is not only the market that determines modern man's character. Another factor closely related is the mode of industrial production. Enterprises become bigger and bigger. The number of people employed by these enterprises as workers or clerks grows incessantly. Ownership is separated from management, and the industrial giants are governed by a professional bureaucracy interested mainly in the smooth functioning and the expansion of their enterprise, rather than in the personal greed for profit per se. What kind of man, then, does our society need in order to function smoothly? It needs men who cooperate easily and in large groups, who want to consume more and more, and whose tastes are standardized and can be easily influenced and anticipated. 
It needs people who feel free and independent, not subject to any authority or principle or conscience, yet willing to be commanded to do what is expected, to fit into the social machine without friction. People who can be guided without force, led without leaders, be prompted without an aim, accept the aim to be on the move, to function, to get ahead. This kind of man, modern industrialism, has succeeded in producing. He is the automaton, the alienated man. He is alienated in the sense that his, own, his actions and his own forces have become estranged from him. They stand above him and against him and rule him rather than being ruled by him. His life forces have shed themselves into things and institutions, and these things and institutions have become idols. They are experienced not as the result of man's own efforts, but as something apart from him, which he worships and to which he submits. Alienated man bows down before the work of his own hands. His idols represent his own life forces in an alienated form. He experiences himself not as the active bearer of his own forces and riches, but as an impoverished thing, dependent on other things outside of himself into which he has projected his living substance. We feel free and independent, yet we are not from things. We have been made to conform to these standards and ideas and expectations. And that is why we are unhappy. Because we have learned to find happiness only when we are appeasing others. And not when we are following our own desires. We consume and yet we are disappointed. Our lives are not fulfilling because well, we are living a life that we ultimately don't want to live. In some sense, this was unavoidable. We have been conditioned into thinking and acting this way since we were kids. But that doesn't mean that we have to stay in the state that we are in. We always have the capacity to reflect on where we are and make a decision or go, go in a new direction, right? At bottom, Fromm is trying to convince us that we are not at home and at peace with ourselves. We do not know ourselves. We don't want to be with ourselves. Can you sit for 15 minutes alone with your own thoughts in a dark room? Do you think the majority of people can? Or do you watch shows and smoke and drink so you don't have to be with yourself? So you don't have to entertain those thoughts? Are you distracting yourself so you don't have to do this work and this understanding and this exploration? Fromm thinks so. He thinks that our lives in general have lost their meaning and purpose. So much so that we no longer think for ourselves, have our own thoughts, or are living authentic lives. And as a result, we feel tired all the time. And we live passive lives. And we are lazy. He says on page 86, the meaninglessness and alienation of work results in a longing for complete laziness. Man hates his working life because it makes him feel like a prisoner and a fraud. His ideal becomes absolute laziness, in which he does not have to make a move, where everything proceeds according to the Kodak slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. 
This tendency is reinforced by the type of consumption necessary for the expansion of the market, leading to a principle which Huxley has very succinctly expressed in Brave New World. One of the slogans which everyone is conditioned with from childhood in that book is, never put off till tomorrow the fun you can have today. If I do not postpone the satisfaction of my wish, and I am conditioned only to wish for what I can get, I have no conflicts, no doubts, no decision has to be made. I am never alone with myself because I am always busy, either working or having fun. I have no need to be aware of myself as myself because I am constantly absorbed with consuming. I am a system of desire and satisfactions. I have to work in order to fulfill my desires, and these very desires are constantly stimulated and directed by the economic machine. And so in a sense he's saying, we're trying to fill ourselves up with things that aren't going to fill us up. Our lives are not oriented towards living authentically according to our own wishes and desires, but the expectations and standards of others. We don't find joy in our work. We don't find joy in our study because we don't really want to do it. And constantly, when we have leisure time, all we want to do is sit on the couch and watch Netflix or smoke or drink or whatever it is. Our relationships have been impacted by this as well. Nowadays, we don't really connect with people as fully as we could. We don't respect people for their intrinsic worth and their artistic capacities and their powers of love and reason. We treat people like objects, right? Whether that is an object for our own sexual desire or an object to check out our groceries or as an object to buy or sell something else. Our system is not constructed to produce the kind of individual that we will be at peace and secure with. One who is actually following their own wishes and desires and finds happiness within themselves rather than on external things like goods or what other people want from you or how they think and feel about you. And if we go along with what Arendt was saying last class, we now have all these technologies and powers and capacities that can change the world in these crazy ways but because we do not understand ourselves, we don't have the knowledge or the wisdom to wield them for good purposes. And so things are pretty messed up for us. We're messed up. If we're going to change things, we need to take an honest look at our situation from things. We need to come to understand ourselves better, actually reflect on our own wishes and desires. We need to be alone with our own thoughts. We need to try to understand ourselves better. Because if we don't, we're just going to be a puppet in some sense in somebody else's game living according to their will and their desires whether that is your parents or your other family members your friends society at large or the government or companies and other institutions if we don't get a handle on what it is that we actually want what we value and who we are, we're just going to live according to somebody else's designs. 
And as you know, there are a lot of people out there who don't care about you at all. And so they probably don't have your interest at heart, right? Thus, it is time for some self-reflection and honesty and critical thinking from things. If we're going to change things, if we're going to become happy and secure and fulfilled, we're going to have to transform ourselves. And consequently, because our system is designed to produce this in us, in a way, we're going to have to transform society as well if we want to prevent this from happening to future generations and if we want to improve our lives and others lives at the end of this essay he provides a number of points about what is going to need to change in ourselves and in society in order to get us out of this mess, in order to further oppress and alienate us. It's unlikely that we're going to be able to affect serious, good, positive, authentic change just through law or policy or social institutions from the top down. Instead, there will have to be some sort of mass awakening of the individual and mass transformation of individuals. You've heard you can lead a horse to water, right? But you can't force them to drink. If things are going to change, a significant number of individuals are going to have to decide for themselves that they're going to change, that they're going to think differently, that they're going to live differently. And while this is difficult, this is not impossible, right? And even if we can't affect the kind of change that we would like in order to make our system more just and more equitable, we can at least do so for ourselves, right? There are things that we can do for ourselves that will make us happier and more secure and more fulfilled. In nearly every sphere of life, we're going to have to take an honest look at ourselves and change what we are doing. If you're a fan of psychology or psychoanalysis, that might mean shadow work, engaging with those repressed parts of you that you don't want to look at or notice or integrate into your being. We're going to have to work on well, being honest with ourselves and others. Not withholding what we believe all the time because we're afraid of persecution or backlash, but honest self-expression. We're going to have to change our priorities as well. A lot of our priorities right now, he would say, aren't proper. Because what are the things that our lives are oriented around? Well, consumption. And he's going to say that can't be top dog in your worldview if you want to be happy and secure and fulfilled. What should be at the top, perhaps, is working on oneself becoming smarter, becoming stronger, both physically and psychologically. 
placing ourselves in uncomfortable situations so that we can learn and grow, so that we can expand, expand our horizons, not only socially, but also mentally, right? We're going to have to change also how we are relating to others. We need to work on practicing more compassion and charity and love. Not, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Not, I don't care about you, check out my groceries. But, how are you today? What has been going on with you? That is a lovely shirt you are wearing. He says what might help also is a kind of revitalization of art and culture. Because the art and cultural stuff that we have now is standardized, mass-produced, unfulfilling garbage. <laughs> Just to give you a sense of my own personal thoughts and feelings, I think a lot of modern art sucks. It's like a five-year-old drew it. What happened to those awesome like expressionist paintings and landscapes and all these different things, right? In short, then, we need to spend less time consuming, more time thinking and creating works that are reflective of our own unique individuality. Of course, he also offers some social and political prescriptions as well. He thinks we need to decentralize economics and politics. He's a form of democratic, he likes democratic socialism as a kind of mode of socioeconomic organization. You don't have to go along with him in that, but he thinks that would be more fair thinks that would give people the opportunity to live the kind of lives that they want. If we're going to change things on the larger scale, we're going to have to reform our economies so they're not just centered around mass production and consumption, but actually the upkeep and the sustaining of human life and what is actually valuable, like relationships and experiences, love and hope, the real stuff of human life. In short, and this is rather uncontroversial, he advocates for the creation of a society based in freedom, fairness, love, and solidarity. Like every other hippie, right? Well, I wouldn't say he's a hippie. <laughs> And that sounds good, right? Wouldn't it be great if we all loved each other, cared about each other, worked for each other's needs? Sounds good. I don't know. In some way, we need to recapture those things that gave life meaning in the past. They will probably have to take on a new form but our current state in which we are estranged from ourselves and others is just going to lead us further into darkness and misery. We need to find purpose and meaning, engage in self-expression. We need to do that stuff again. But it starts with each one of us individually. You can make the choice today to think and do things differently. It won't be easy. We all have these habits that we engage in, right? These perspectives that are entrenched in our own minds of the world. But we can expand our minds. We can slowly change things. 
we can replace our bad habits with good ones slowly over time. It is not impossible. Yes, it will take work. It will take a lot of energy and effort. But Fromm is going to say it will be worth it for you because you will no longer feel lost and nihilistic and cynical and hopeless. That's basically what Fromm has to say. And why I think it's an interesting piece to discuss in our class is because what he was writing in the 20th century is something that is on a lot of people's radars now. What is the big scare nowadays? That F word. Fascism. Everybody's worried about fascists. Right? The right are a bunch of fascists. The left are a bunch of fascists. Well, Fromm said people would gravitate towards that when they don't have the meaning and the purpose and security in their life. They will reach out for anything that could provide them with that kind of order and that will tear them away from the isolation that they feel. And so I think his work is pretty prescient. And it con connects with contemporary issues. That's why we're looking at it in this class. So what do you all think? Good, bad, ugly? I mean, I genuinely like agree with what he's saying. I think it's just like a really hard concept for people to fully understand because it's like super uncomfortable. Sure, yeah. OK, so you're a fan? I'm a fan. OK. What do the rest of you all think? Right, wrong, boring. Mm hmm. I mean, I, I also agree. Like, I've always thought like the how we value like being a productive member of society to be like very dehumanizing because it's like yeah the way we treat people that we don't view to be productive members of society. Like, what really like what does that mean? Like, what are we producing? Like, it's just. And we tear ourselves down, yeah. right, when we don't live up to the kinds of expectations and work ethic that we were taught we're supposed to mm -hmm. do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but go on. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, um, I think it's just, like, kind of like what he's saying. It's like it, we don't look at, like, how, like, I don't know. I see people out on the street. I'm like, that is literally someone's, like, son, daughter. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's they have love to give and they should receive love as well and it's like we don't even like see that and if it's like if we can't live with love like why are we like why if we can't like experience like those good things that are meaningful then what is like meaning to us if it's if it's just production and consumerism like is that like what's the meaning in that it satisfies our desires a lot of people are happy with that but as Kierkegaard would say, the satisfaction of your desires will not be a fulfilling life for you because you can't fully satisfy them. They will always come back. And you will just want new things and other things. So it's a losing game, which is why he encourages we should develop a relationship with God, but that's a separate thing. You might not agree with that strategy. Um, speaking on his argument specifically about <coughs> isolation and like be in favor of like even fascism because what pulls you out of isolation. Yeah. I think that obviously I know it only his opinion only really reached to like society in the mid century. Yeah. But um, I think that that kind of died out in the later of the twentieth century and then reformed in the twenty first again. So there's something at the end of the twentieth century that kind of pulled people together. Now I I don't know if there was specific things. I think it was more so in the mid-century, the economic benefit we got from World War II that was still spinning off of that, I think created a better life of luxury for a lot of the middle class Yeah. that made people make different connections and find joy and happiness in the things that they were able to do with more wealth. Sure. But I think it's most seen in specifically in the mid-century, like fraternal organizations and frats and HOAs were really, really, really popular. 
and then they slowly died out towards the end of the 20th century and then so like I'll say late 80s early 90s and then in the 21st century which I think also might be a societal and cultural result of partially 9-11 and perhaps those communities dissolving right those spaces and opportunities for people to come together and you know I think they reformed like we even see that it's really popular right now with I mean fraternities and sororities have always been popular but I think fraternal organizations supper clubs things like that they're all kind of slowly coming back Mm. to style because people are able to see their isolation and reform around things that might be problematic but they don't really care because they have a group that is their group right that provides them with certain security right makes it so that they don't feel so alone yeah 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 great I feel like there are also like certain forms of consumption that are like healthy for us like like he was saying like kind of like the arts and like if people mm. like picked up a book and like read like I feel like nowadays mm-hmm. like our form of consumption is like the extreme form like our cell phones or social media or whatever but like there are like more simpler like kind of like basic forms of consumption that I feel like do encourage you to like think Mm -hmm. you know like not so like much brain rot but it's like you know people of our like generation we're like moving so far away from like reading and writing and all of that and like maybe if we are like we started to you know look into like old books and stuff like that we can think more about Right, so maybe it's not insumption itself that is the problem, but maybe it's this kind of stuff, right? The type of consumption that we're engaged in, the objects of our consumption, and the intensity with which we do it, right? Because I, I think I would agree with you. Like, there seems to be something more meaningful about listening to a work of Mozart than watching Big Brother. Although we want to watch Big Brother, right? <laughs> or whatever it is any one of those reality shows. Yeah, I I think within his analysis, there's room for saying consumption can be a part of our lives, um, provided it is proper. The problem that we're facing now is it's just way too much a part of our lives, he thinks, that it's making us feel like crap. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other thoughts? Um, something um, like I've always kind of gone back to when like talking about like consumerism, like what it means to like feel like live with like goodness, sort of like the Freeman's worship. I'm like been obsessed with that. But, mm-hmm. um, Russell's piece, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, just like I guess the idea of like hedonism and I feel like how we've kind of misconstrued that because it's like you know the idea of like short short term pleasure versus like long term and how like hedonistically it's like the idea is that you're like valuing pleasure like over like that's like your main goal is like a Mm -hmm. pleasurable life but it's like I think we tend to like think like oh well if I want a pleasurable life, I need the things that I want and that I desire that give me pleasure, but it's like, I feel like we don't look at like long term versus short term, because I feel like a lot of these short short term things that give us pleasure, like quick, and it only lasts so long, and then I think right. that leads to ultimately like dread and the lack of pleasure. And Emptiness, and maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look around at how people are behaving and the kinds of lives they're living today, it does seem to be the case that people are following a life philosophy of hedonism, right? Chasing after pleasure. But a lot of philosophers are going to say that isn't a sustainable way to live. I mean, look at what scrolling for hours on our phones is doing to our attention span and our ability to cultivate pleasure from that activity. Does anybody feel pleasure watching three hours of Netflix? Like really? 
or is some kind of neural circuitry in your brain being hijacked and just now you're not experiencing the neurotransmitters like you used to because you're you've been engaged in these activities for so long and it doesn't really provide you with pleasure but you can't tear yourself away from it and yeah it's like crazy because i feel like even where people used to be able to like sit and watch youtube videos like no one can even do that anymore because of tiktok like if they're not 10 second videos yeah right yeah. just skip literally. right and like <laughs> youtube is like literally going like downhill like no like not a lot of people watch it anymore which makes me sad because i love watching youtube like vloggers and shit but yeah yeah, like TikTok is like it is like psychological because it's it's little burst of dopamine. Like every time you scroll, and it's a bottomless pit. Like you'll never run out of content. You'll never run out of content. Yeah. yeah. People, so many people post a day. So. Yeah. Good, good points. If there's one thing that I can leave you with, and we'll leave a few minutes early here, it's this. I don't want you to think I'm telling you how to think or live or anything. But what I hope this class is doing for you is it's just getting you to think about your condition. It's getting to think about the things that you accept, the things that you believe. I don't really care like about what you believe or what you want to do. But I hope that you seriously reflect on where you're at, what you want, and how you want the world to be. Because if Fromm is right, then if you don't do that, things are probably just going to get worse for yourself and others. So think and talk about this stuff. Reflect on your own experience, so on and so forth. OK. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I will see you on Wednesday, where we'll be starting our last unit, talking about life questions and philosophies of life. Thanks again.